the thing with smoking, I'll, I'll ask you to fill these out if you can. Okay. Just so, just some uh, okay. casual information. Okay. Um, hypnosis works really fantastic for smoking. Uh, that's why I do a lot of smoking business. Probably, uh, I guess, probably a thousand people I've helped stop smoking. Mm -hmm. And uh, my general success rate is about 90%. And the other 10% really are, for one reason or another, uh, they're not fully prepared to quit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Or they don't... Uh, they don't inside expect to quit, mm -hmm. okay? I try and um, uh, catch those people over the phone when I talk to them in the beginning. You recall as I talked to you, Jen, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that, you know, I said uh, it's important to have the motivation. Uh, hypnosis is not just a thing where you can snap your fingers and make you do anything, right. you know, that the hypnotist yeah. wants. Mm -hmm. It's it's really about you making the change. Uh, and I mentioned about the motivation. Over the years, I've only found one motivation that is reliable, okay, to have people quit smoking, and that's they get to a point, they resent the control that the habit has over them. Uh, they take it on a, on a, a basis of individual freedom, Okay, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to quit, uh, health reasons, cost reasons, mm -hmm. uh, but they they really don't right. <laughs> they don't yeah. stand up with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, you would think that would be a great motivator. Smoking's going to kill you, yeah. but it but it really isn't. Nobody quits for that reason. Uh, Nobody quits because of the cost of them. They're about six dollars a pack. I know. I, I was telling Jim, my wife smokes the most expensive cigarettes. They're like seven fifty a pack or mm -hmm. something. You know, they're those little uh, swizzle sticks. Mm -hmm. You know, it, they can't have half the tobacco of a normal cigarette. Yeah. It's just so yeah. long and thin. And um, and you know, nobody knows that better than the politicians. Yeah. Because yeah. cause basically cigarettes cost the same they cost, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It's all tax mm -hmm. on yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and, and they know that, you know, they'll lose a couple people when they increase the price. A couple people will say, I've had enough, you know, but yeah. not many. It's still about, uh, they place it in, in Pennsylvania between 20 and 26 percent of the people still smoke. Although that ha that is declining a little bit, just because they're making it so difficult right. for people yeah, to smoke. Uh, I have more business, I guess, in the last two years in smoking than I've, I've ever, ever had, really. And I think some of it's just people are getting sick and tired of the costs and everything, and uh, the social stigma with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people really, really treat smokers badly. They t they. They train children to treat smokers badly, so mm -hmm. people just get sick and tired of it, you know. Smoking really is a habit. Uh, no matter what uh, other people will, uh, doctors and a lot of doctors say, oh, it's an addiction. Uh, one of my favorite is the is that... Uh, medical correspondent on CNN that uh, Sanjay Gupta he he's all big about smoking he said uh, he goes being being a smoker is worse it's harder to get off smoking than to get off heroin I've heard that right I have heard that. and I, I'll explain to you exactly why what the reasoning is they say on that <clears throat> right heroin you get physically addicted to cigarettes you don't okay it's a habit uh, and I found that over the years. Uh, when the hospitals, they have their smoking cessation programs, they're basically behavioral modification, conscious effort, willpower-based programs, right? Willpower was never meant to change habits. It just doesn't work, you know. So when they put these people in these eight-week programs at the hospital, all of it's funded by that tobacco suit money, so it's all free to them. 
okay? They put them in these sessions, right? They get about 2% success rate. <laughs> Two out of 100 after six months have quit smoking. Now, if you take a heroin addict and you put them into rehab and you detox them, the success rate is 4% after, after really a year. Okay, so four out of a hundred. That's not very good. But two out of a hundred is awful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he says, oh, it's got to be harder than getting off of, you know, heroin. Yeah. And it isn't. Hey, right? it isn't. But trying to do it that way that they're doing it, it's almost yeah. impossible yeah. as you can see it. Willpower is great as long as you keep your mind on it. <laughs> as long as you're paying attention. And, and I'll have people come to me, they'll quit for some of them six months, you know, just using willpower, you know, they'll be miserable, they'll, they'll just, you know, it's just a horrible thing because they, they still have that habit going and what they're doing is they're depriving themselves. So it creates like an inner conflict and they have all this anxiety. When people try to stop like that, they'll snap at you. Uh, you know, when, you know, the funny thing was used to be, oh, they quit smoke and stay away from mm -hmm. them, you know. Yeah. And that's because you, 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 you have yeah. that conflict going. And the thing is that unless you pay attention, unless you give it that conscious effort, which willpower is a conscious process, uh, you're, you're going to go back, re revert to that old habit, which is still running. Uh, a lot of times people come to me and say, I was okay until we went out and had a few drinks, right? And then I just said, ah, heck with it and started smoking again. Mm -hmm. What happened is you, your, your inhibitions came down with some alcohol, right? And you just weren't willing to make the conscious effort anymore. Mm -hmm. And once that came down, that habit's still running. Habits are like computer programs, right? You know, once we get them going, they just run on their own. They're subconscious based. You know, uh, a lot of times uh, when you smoke, you light up a cigarette and not really even know you did it. You know, not really consciously. It's just something natural that you yeah, do. Yeah. You know. So what hypnosis helps, okay, is to reach into our subconscious and to change on that level where the habit really is. Okay, instead of trying to whack it with willpower, that conscious effort, change the program, okay, actually go back to the original program, because originally we were all non-smokers, go back to that original program, and then we don't have the conflict inside, okay, it just doesn't like occur to us to smoke, mm -hmm. you know, so it's natural, you know, you, you have friends who don't smoke, they have that non-smoking habit. It it doesn't occur to them to pick up a cigarette, right. you know. And that's that's what we're looking for today. Okay. That way, it's easy, yeah. you know. <laughs> Most of the people who come to me, as long as they have the right motivation and everything, follow a few simple instructions. They just don't have the desire anymore. Uh, and they tell me how easy it is, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, a smaller percentage of them do every now and then have a thought, you know, about smoking. A lot of us have smoked for quite a few years. It, it, it's natural to have a thought about it and everything. But those thoughts can easily just, eh, I don't smoke, you know. Every now and then I get somebody who is successful but they do think about it a lot. What I tell them is, uh, you know, if they want, they can come back and we can help take care of those thoughts. But generally, those thoughts, you can go right past them. And as time goes on, they're just less and less and less. So, mm -hmm. The one thing that people... Um, the most the most common feedback I get from people is how easy it is for them with hypnosis as opposed to other things, the other ways that they've tried. I get about one person a month who comes to me to get off the Nicorette gum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think, I think that's worse 
than cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. We've tried, I mean, we've tried everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, patch. <clears throat> patch uh, gum, cold turkey. Tantix. E-cig, we just tried. Tantix, I that was prescribed, did. and um, I, uh, I heard all the bad things about it. Yeah. So I never They're all it. true. <laughs> yeah. I never even started it, taking it. Yeah, I, n I never took it or anything, but I, almost everybody I see has been prescribed it. And it's funny, right on TV, uh, say side effects can include suicidal yeah. thoughts and or suicide. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Just like it's nothing, you know? You, yeah. you know, you may kill yourself. <laughs> But don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. You won't be smoking. Yeah, that's only a few. <laughs> you know, we'll lose a few. <laughs> but the uh, what I've heard is uh, one person, I guess about a year ago, God explained it to me. Dreams worse than any horror movie you could ever imagine. Just demons chasing you. Just the most disturbing, horrifying nightmares. I had those with the patch. <coughs> Did now, you? I put it on at night. Mm -hmm. I guess it was my body thinking that, hey, you don't, you don't normally have nicotine in your, uh, at, that, at least that level of nicotine mm -hmm. in your system over right. the time. Nightmare dreams. Really? It's real. Horrible. Huh. Horrible. Yeah. Oh, they're no fun. It's <laughs> hellish. <laughs> I used to always, I used to just have trouble sleeping. I didn't have any nightmares, but I would have trouble sleeping when I did mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, here's the thing about nicotine, okay? Nicotine's not physically addictive, okay? Uh, some, some people would lead you to believe that. It really isn't. It's classified. It's actually controlled, um, um, I believe by the Department of Agriculture as opposed to the Food and Drug Administration. It's not a drug. It's, it's classified as a, as a, uh, as an agricultural poison. Okay. In fact, the major use of nicotine was as a, uh, insecticide. Okay. In the fields. They had to stop using it, I believe, in the 30s because they found it to be too potent. Uh, it's so potent when they, they get the extract out of the tobacco plant. Um, they say uh, pure nicotine, a teaspoon, can kill a full-size elephant in 30 seconds. That's how strong it is. And what was happening was, was farmers were getting, they were killing themselves. They were getting all in their hands in, in high concentrations. Mm -hmm. So it's actually an agricultural poison. Uh, very effective. The thing is that... In cigarettes, we're getting just a, a fairly minute amount. Uh, the thing is when, you know, we get used to that poison, okay, taking that in. When we take that away, we will feel different because we've been taking that for so long. However, there's nothing in our body that will crave that again, okay? Uh, it's, it's not the, the chemical, physical, Addiction, actually, that's where addiction comes from, is not there. Okay, if you were to take heroin, okay, every day, all the time, and you take that away, you'll go through withdrawal symptoms, and your body will actually physically crave that, right? Uh, same thing with all opiates. Actually, even alcohol is that way, when done in, in sufficient quantities and on a regular basis. Your body will actually crave that, and in cases such as things with alcohol, they have to be very careful uh, taking away alcohol from people who are severe alcoholics and who are active, actively drinking. Uh, the highest fatalities in rehabs, you know, and I get calls from alcoholics and everything, and you have to be very careful. And the one thing you have to tell them is don't stop drinking, right? Because mm -hmm. right? they can have seizures and die mm -hmm. because of the addictive nature of the chemicals, actually. Mm -hmm. Nicotine doesn't have that, right? So, you know, I, I kind of compare it to if you were, if you were taking a very tiny bit of rat poison every day, nothing you'd do, but just for an example, uh, you'd get used to that, right? You know, it wouldn't kill you, at least not in the short term. 
and you'd kind of get used to it. And if you stopped taking it, you'd feel different, okay, because you were used to taking it. After, after a couple days, okay, you'd feel fine. You'd feel a lot better. Most people, once they stop taking nicotine, start feeling better right away, okay? Uh, usually it takes about, to get nicotine out of your system, two or three days. It's water soluble and it comes out fairly easily. So a lot of people expect all these things that really don't have to happen. Uh, the way our mind works, the number one way that our mind works is what we expect tends to be realized, okay? So a lot of times we're told, okay, when you stop smoking, you're going to have these cravings for cigarettes. By the mere expectation that we have of having these cravings will cause them to happen for us. We will crave cigarettes. if we're, And it, it's really, it's just information we're getting from other people, right? One of the things we do become somewhat addictive to okay, that is in cigarettes is sugar. There's three types of sugar in cigarettes. The leaves are, the tobacco is treated with it. There's a lot of things cigarettes are treated with, store-bought cigarettes. Uh, it's treated with high fructose corn syrup and two other types of sugar. So, and I caution people on this because this comes into play sometimes. Uh, cigarettes don't taste real sweet, okay? Uh, that sugar in there does temper the taste a little and everything. However, you know, uh, when you eat sugar, you can kind of get somewhat addictive to it. Your body gets used to it, and if you're used to having like a candy bar in the afternoon or something, you'll get like a craving for that. Your body will like that sugar level that goes up and down. Uh, you, you, you don't, you're not aware that you're getting, getting those hits of sugar, but even with the smoke, you're taking sugar in in one of the most direct routes that you can take it in through the walls of your lungs, right? And it goes right, even though it's a small amount, it goes right into your bloodstream, okay? So your sugar levels when you smoke cigarettes are actually changing, and people aren't aware of this. And sometimes when they stop smoking, Right, they'll feel what they interpret to be somewhat of a craving, and it is the desire for that sugar. Okay, that can it's it's not a lot of sugar, but it often comes into play. And what I recommend to people is for the first couple of days after they smoke to get it like a pack of lifesavers, you know, and in a matter of a couple of days you can basically wean yourself off of that. But uh, a lot of times they'll misinterpret that as a craving, and it's that, that little hit of sugar. Uh, one of the other misconceptions exceptions that people have about stopping smoking is that they will gain weight if they stop smoking. And the truth is that the average person in America who stops smoking gains between 7 and 22 pounds. Okay, And I'll tell you the reason why is because that program's still running, okay? That smoking program, they're quitting with either the hospital program or they're trying to quit cold turkey, they're putting the patch on, it really doesn't matter, but that habit's still running. So in order to satisfy that habit, you know, there's that conflict going on in there. They're edgy, they have anxiety. In order to quell that down, it's just, I'll stick something in my mouth. And that seems to satisfy it short term. You can see what the results are. They have to do it a lot. So that's where they get the 7 to 22 pounds. The only way you gain weight is to eat more. And there's no reason to eat more unless you want to eat more. Okay? Smoking really doesn't have anything to do with it. The reason that people gain weight is because that they're not changing the habit. They still have the habit going. Most of those people who gain that weight, okay, actually go back to smoking because they still have that smoking habit going. And then they just turn into being an overweight smoker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then they try to stop again and they get heavier and heavier. And it's a vicious circle. So that's why that's all occurring, you know. Uh, what hypnosis is, is it's merely a state of mind 
that we all go in and out of naturally all the time. When we wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, we come up through a, a hip, hypno, a hypnopompic uh, state, okay, which is a natural state of hypnosis. I always caution people when you get up in the morning, be careful what your thoughts are. Because if you get up in the morning and say, oh, today's going to be an awful day, you're actually programming your subconscious mind to, to make that happen for you. And more often than not, as with your expectations, you'll find that that's what you get for the, the day. Right? Your thoughts in, when you first wake up in the morning are very important. You know, you can program your whole day and program your subconscious. We have two minds, which there's no actual organ. We have a brain and everything. But the mind is a concept that we use to, uh, basically it explains how we work, how we operate. About 10% of us is our conscious mind. That's our logical thinking mind. Uh, our conscious mind sleeps at night. And until our conscious mind goes to sleep, we don't go to sleep. Our subconscious mind is 90% of us. It's like our automatic mind. It works as like our assistant. It, it makes up the majority of who we are. Uh, we give off tasks, okay, to our subconscious mind so that we can go on thinking about other things. It separates man from the animals. It gives us extra capabilities. Uh, to be able to reason something out. We're the only animal that can do math, right? Okay, that's a conscious process where we can figure that out, okay? We can also be doing math and reasoning and thinking about things while we're driving, okay? And that is because our subconscious mind, after we learn to drive and after a few years we get used to it, we, we basically almost totally drive with our subconscious mind. It's like having an assistant with us, you know. Uh, our subconscious mind has all our habits. Most of the habits that we do, 99.99% .99 of our habits are either good or neither good nor bad. They make up who we are, okay. There are a lot of things that we do on a normal basis that we don't even think about. We get up in the morning, we brush our teeth, you know, we get get ready to go, we get dressed and everything. One thing I ask men is, when you get up in the morning, <coughs> every morning we put our pants on, which leg do you put on first? <laughs> don't know. <laughs> you do it every day. <laughs> See, and that, I, I, I get everybody thinking about it. Now, the thing is, You'll stop tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> and then you won't know what to do. We've been doing it since we were, what, four or five years old or whatever. Uh, that's our subconscious mind does it. We don't even think about it. Now, you may put on your left leg. I may put on my right leg, but we both get our pants on. Yeah. So your left leg's neither good nor bad. You know, it's good getting the pants on, but it's, it's neither good nor bad. However, if you got up and tried to put a different leg on, you'd feel unsettled. <laughs> you would, because it's just not comfortable. You know, it, it wouldn't be natural. Um, these habits, okay, as we get older, okay, uh, there, there, there becomes like a separation between our conscious mind and our subconscious mind, okay? And what happens actually is like a wall comes up between it. Okay, so that these habits we have, which as I said, 99.99% of them are, are either good or neither good nor bad, that wall keeps, keeps us from having input in, in our conscious life that would change those habits. It really prevents them from changing, right? What that does is give us a sense of self, a sense of being the same every day, we do certain things, like me and my wife, we do certain things completely different. We get the same results. However, when we're told to do it the other way, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable and very unsettling to us. We, we get that sense of self to it. It's very healthy in everything. 
as we uh, and this starts happening when we're about 12 years old 10 to 12 years old in there that wall comes up and that's when we run into a problem when we have a habit that we don't like okay which is why you two are here okay it's behind that wall in our subconscious and what happens is we, when we take that conscious effort okay and we come to a logical conclusion I don't want to smoke anymore. I want to be a non-smoker. Okay, that we take that thought and we try to get it across to our subconscious where our habit is, where that program is running. We say, I want that to change, right? Well, what happens is it hits that wall, hits that wall, and just bounces off. The only place it can go is to willpower, which is conscious effort, you know? And that's why Conscious effort cannot get through that wall, you know, uh, uh, willpower cannot get through that wall. What we can actually do in hypnosis, it's, as I said, it's a natural state of mind. Uh, it's not sleep. It's not unconsciousness or anything. Uh, it's very similar to daydreaming. We do it all the time. We're, we're in and out of these levels all day. If we sit and daydream, we're actually in a state of hypnosis. One of the byproducts of this state of hypnosis is that our wall comes down, okay? Now, we're always, our mind always protects us, okay? So that some, not just anything can come across that wall, okay? It has to be something that we want, okay? If it's something we don't like or, or something that we have problems with, our, inner mind or subconscious mind will just reject it. So we're, we have that uh, built-in part of safety. That's Because I always tell people, you can't be made to do anything you don't want to do in hypnosis. And generally, I don't have that problem here because people call me up because they want to do something. Okay, But while we're in that state where our wall is down, okay, that's where we can get across that change. Okay. And once our subconscious mind accepts the change of that program, okay, that habit, then it's done. Okay, and that's why people stop and they stay stopped. Now, there's, there's certain things that predicate this happening. Okay, there's certain things that have to happen for this to happen. First of all, we have to get in a state where a wall lowers down. But we have to have a certain mental attitude. That controls whether our subconscious will accept this change, this thought, this idea. I'm a non-smoker, okay? Uh, we can accept it in one of four ways, okay? We can say, I don't like that. You know, I'm a non-smoker. I don't like that, right? Uh, that's not going to work with me, okay? Our subconscious mind, if, if that's the case, just rejects it. Okay, that's our protection working there. We can also say, I like that. I want that. You know, it sounds good, but I don't think it's going to work for me. Okay, I'm not going to change. That's where our expectations come in. And what happens when our, our subconscious mind sees that our expectations aren't there, it'll reject that. Okay, won't change. Okay. We can also say, I like that suggestion. I'm a non-smoker. I want that. It's good. And I hope that works for me. <laughs> Our subconscious mind interprets hope and try as an uncertain outcome or possible failure of outcome. Like if we tell somebody, I'll try and call you next week. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> Right, so that's where our expectations come in. Like when people call me on the phone and say, I'd like to try hypnosis. I say, well, I don't try hypnosis. We either do it or we don't because that's the way our minds work, you know. Uh, so if, if you're not, and the thing is our subconscious is somewhat lazy too, right? You have to really satisfy all the criteria to make sure that change happens. Otherwise, you're... Your subconscious mind will say, I already got something going. I'm a smoker here, <laughs> you know, right? It, it doesn't make changes that it, it doesn't have to, you know. 
And negatives, it accepts negatives very easy. You know, positives, positives require action. Negatives don't require any action. So the subconscious really kind of works that way. We'll accept negative things much, much uh, easier than accepting a positive thing as far as a change. However, there is one mental attitude that will that will force the, our subconscious mind to change, which is what we want to do today. It's, I like that suggestion. I want that suggestion. That's why I'm here. You know, this is this is it, and this is going to work for me, right? When we have that mental attitude and that expectation, our subconscious mind has no choice but to accept it. Once our subconscious mind accepts it, okay, it becomes permanent for us. Okay, we become a non-smoker. So actually we're taking that old program and throwing it out and, and leaving the original program where we're nice and comfortable. And the thing is, when we change like that subconsciously, we have no conflict. That's why people tell me it's so easy with hypnosis to stop smoking because they don't have that program running inside them. There's no internal conflict. There's no squabble going on between the conscious and the subconscious. Right? It's just very comfortable and very easy. You know, uh, no anxiety, anything. In fact, people think of it as a big relief because they were struggling with their smoking habit. They didn't want to smoke. You know, our conscious mind is meant to be the boss. Okay, uh, as I said, it's what separates us from the animals, the power to do math, logic, and everything, and to really think things out. But sometimes it gets backwards, and, and this is one of those cases when we have a habit that we, we don't want. And what hypnosis helps to do is to put the right part back in control and make that change, you know. And, and it's getting in the right state of mind, okay, where that wall comes down and that we can get our wishes across to our subconscious and force our subconscious to make it so that then we can make instantaneous change, you know, and just of these habits. And that's why it's so easy. And that, and that when you go to the hospital programs, they're 2%. And I have people here who are 90%. And the thing is that their mind is doing all the work for them, you know. No patches, no drugs. You don't need them, <laughs> you know, because you don't have the habit, you know. Um, you know, people ask me what, what I need. The, the only thing I tell them they need is that thing I told them about the sugar, you know, and maybe having some lifesavers. And just, I find that as long as people are aware of something, they can deal with it, you know, it's no big deal. I, I don't like them to be unaware of that, you know, at all. So, as I said, nicotine, it's it's not addictive. There's nothing that's going to pull you back to it. It's just like that little, little tiny bit of rat poison every day is really all it is, you know. What do you think? Does it sound like a plan? Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely explains it more. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what my biggest curiosity is, is how things will be, you know, afterwards, like, how are they going to make me feel different, you know what I mean? I, I, I guess I don't know what to expect as far as, well, uh, you know, like, I smoke all the time when I'm in the car, like, mm -hmm. to have that. We all, uh, we all take our habit, okay, and connect it to things of value in our life. One of the big things in this world now, the way they have people at work, they don't permit smoking at work, but generally, uh, like most offices and everything, they make you go outside. So here what happens is a lot of times people will have a smoking lounge outside or they will call their friend who works at the same company and they'll get together and go out. Um, one thing I'm very, uh, you know, I, I tell people, these are all good things. I said, the only thing you want out of your life is that cigarette. That's it. 
I said, however, like a couple times a day, if you're a smoker at work, a couple times a day, you get up and go outside. Right? I said, you got to take a break. You know, what, what some people do at work when they try to stop smoking is they'll sit at their desk all day and they'll go half crazy, you know, because their, their mind can't handle it. You know, they're, they're at work like all day. They need a break physically and mentally, right? They also need to socialize. So that cigarette has all kinds of connections to it that are valuable that, that they need. And I tell people, you can go out with, I said, if you have a friend you smoke with, I said, at work, and you go out with all the other people who smoke at work, you go out with them. I said, the only thing that we're working with is your cigarette, right, and your habit. However, you get a lot of benefit out of it. A lot of times you have a social aspect of it. You talk. Uh, people who, people, if you ever want to know anything about any business, <laughs> go out to where the people are smoking. They all know. Yeah. Right. That's where you hear all the gossip. Yep. Th this is stuff you need. <laughs> it helps you survive. Yeah. You know, the only thing is, and uh, I had a, I guess at the beginning of summer, a girl came to me and uh, she had a situation. She goes, here's a, here's a situation. She had a real dread. She goes, I want to quit, but she goes, uh, during the summer, she goes like, our house backs up to a couple houses. We all have decks, right? And we socialize at night. She goes, like, every night of the week. She goes, we're on what? Well, their deck, on they're on our deck and everything. She goes, and she goes, all my neighbors pretty much smoke. She goes, we all drink. And they sit out there and they talk and they have a good time. They're all friends. And she didn't want stopping smoking, interfering with that, right? And I didn't, I told you, I don't blame you. I said, it's an important part of your life. She goes, I love doing that. You know, they'll, they'll cook out and everything, and they just sound like really good friends and everything. They all, and she didn't want to stop drinking, you know. She goes, I'm afraid if I start drinking, they'll, I'll start smoking, because that's what kept happening before. So I said, you know, none of this has anything to bear. You know, on it. It really doesn't. And the only thing that really would interfere with you is your expectations. What we expect tends to be realized. If we expect to, like, if we expect to sit around people that are smoking, okay, and, and we expect that it to have an effect on us, if we expect for somebody being near us smoking, that it will make us want to smoke, then our mind will give us that. Our, our subconscious mind has no logic to it. Right? So what we expect, even though it's goofy, it'll do for us. You know, that's why I tell people, be careful what you think in the morning and what you expect, because yeah. <laughs> you're going to get it. If you expect today to be a, a bad day, you know, you look out the window, oh, it's raining, it's going to be a bad day, your subconscious mind will will help that ha ha make that happen with a lot of a lot of weird little things, but you know things that happen when you're not thinking. Right. So there's nothing really. Uh, I tell people it's some, it's somewhat like a surgical removal of that cigarette out of your life because we have so many connections that are valuable. One of the biggest things is. Uh, the ability to take a break, okay, uh, not only physically but mentally. Uh, oftentimes, when we're we may be working on a an issue or a problem that requires a lot of thought and everything, and it may get to the point where we don't have a solution to it. It may even get to be a point where it's frustrating. It could be something we're working on physically or just mentally. And we get to a point where we go, oh, I need a cigarette. Okay. Then we go out and have a cigarette. We look up in the sky. <laughs> and we come back in and all of a sudden we have our solution. 
We didn't need that cigarette. Okay, we needed a break. We needed to change our train of thought. And what happened is we, we have that cigarette connected to that change of mind, that change of our mental state. Okay. Now, we can, that, that's very important for all of us, the ability to, because what happens is uh, the way our subconscious works, that those answers that we get come from our subconscious. And once we, once we stop trying, once we stop thinking so hard, and we walk away and just think about something else, things will dawn on us. That's coming from our subconscious, you know. As, as long as we keep trying to pull the answers out, they don't come. It's the way the subconscious works. Once we sit back and just think about something else, all of a sudden the light bulb goes on the idea comes out. They used to tell us when we were little, whenever we had an important decision or a problem in our life, They'd say, why don't you sleep on it? Okay. What that in effect is doing is, as opposed to staying up all night worrying about it, it's actually letting our subconscious mind come up with solutions for us. And then it's often when we sleep on something, we get up the next morning, and after we're up for a few minutes, all of a sudden we have an idea. Oh, I'm going to do this, you know. That's the way our, our subconscious mind works. Right? So these kind of things are very valuable to us. But as long as we're aware of them, we can make new connections. Right? People who don't smoke, they do the same things. Right? They just do it in a little different way. Okay? They never had the cigarette hooked up to it. Okay? Smokers get the cigarette attached to that process. Okay? Uh, also... We often use cigarettes to reward ourselves. Okay, after we work on something a long time, you know, we're really working on it, and we finish, and it's like, oh, geez, that was, you know, you may feel proud of yourself or whatever. You finally conquered whatever it was. You know, oh, I need a cigarette. You know, the thing that we really need is to reward ourselves, right? Because we did our job good. Okay. Uh, somehow we've gotten cigarettes hooked up in there. And a lot of it's come from other people, which really even dates back to the old cigarette advertising. You know, oh, so nice that you know, they'd have the cup of coffee. I remember the old one with Joe DiMaggio. He'd sit there with a the cup of coffee. Oh, it's great, great, so relaxing. You know, <laughs> relaxation is one of the biggest things tied to it. And... A lot of times it comes mainly from the suggestion of others. There's nothing in a cigarette that relaxes you. Nothing. Right? You relax yourself when you're having a cigarette. Okay? But there's nothing chemically in that cigarette to, to make you relax. If anything, uh, what's in a cigarette will put you a little on edge. The chemicals. Because you're taking in a little poison. You're taking in some sugar and among other things. Saltpeter and... and who knows what else? Right. So there's nothing relaxing. You're doing the relaxing. You just have gotten that connected to that. What I do in hypnosis is in hypnosis, we'll each go through your mind, okay? And you'll do, this is all of the things that you do, and just break all those connections, okay? So that they're not there anymore, because those connections are often are things that hold us back into that habit. Okay, in order for us to let that habit go, okay, we have to go through and sever all of them. Okay, the only ones that uh, uh, that I've ever had problems with, okay, in the past is the connections that are very rare. Okay, and mostly I found those connections to be deep grief or social unsettling. Okay, and usually I will get calls back from people, sometimes a year or two after they've stopped smoking, and they'll say, I went back to smoking. And I'll say, what happened? My father died. Okay, uh, my wife left me. I got laid off. Okay, those are connections that we have, responses that we have, 
that we're really not aware of on a daily basis. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to make you aware. We'll go in and if they're there in you, you can separate them. Often we don't think about them because they're, they, we may, they're connections that we could possibly use only a couple times in our life. Okay. But they would possibly connect to a cigarette. Okay. So what I have people do is to just go through and look for all the possible connections that they have uh, in their mind. Go through and just basically sever them so that they're not there. Um, you probably have different connections. You probably have similar connections. You may have a connection to each other. <laughs> you may smoke together, right? Uh, which are all things that, you know, the thing is you still want to be together, but you just don't want those two cigarettes in there, okay? Uh, anything of value, right, you can still have. You don't, you don't lose anything being a non-smoker. You don't, you know, and the only people who do are people who are not doing it the right way. Because there's nothing that you have to lose. People say, oh, I, I want to be able to go out and have some drinks, but I'm afraid if I do, I start smoking. That's no reason, right? There's no reason why you can't do anything. There's no reason why you can't be around people who smoke. People come see me, their spouse smokes. Some of their spouses smoke a lot in the house and everything, <laughs> right next to them. And it's no problem for them. The only time it's a problem is when they expect it to be a problem, and there's no reason to expect it to be a, pro a problem. The only thing that we're changing is that part that is in each of your subconscious mind, that program. You know, it's like we're putting a disc into our mind and changing that one program. Now, the thing is that once we break those connections that we have with taking a break, rewarding ourselves, we're free to establish new ones because we've basically been using the cigarette for a while, okay? So you're kind of free to, to build new connections, new ones that, you know, that you want to have, okay, that you like. And now that you're aware that those connections were there and you separate them, now you, uh, you can put the, something new into them, you know? I, I do, tell people it's always important to take a break, get up, walk away from what you're doing. It's good for you mentally, physically, be social and everything. I tell people if you go out a couple times a day at work, go out. You know, they're your friends, you know. They're the people you're used to talking to. The only thing you change is just you and the cigarette. That's it. And there's nothing that anybody else does that will have any bearing on what you do. The smell of it, people think, oh, I'll smell it. I'll want to have one. No. You know, you have friends who are non-smokers, and I'm sure you've smoked in front of them, and they smell your cigarette. The smell of your cigarette has never driven any of them to smoke, you know, to become smokers. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> so if we think of it that way, you know, we get all these these weird expectations in our mind. And as I always tell people, what we expect tends to be realized. If we expect to smell a cigarette and just go berserk for a cigarette, it'll happen. Right. Our mind will do that for us. If we don't, it won't. And there's no reason to, you know. It's not magic smoke, it's cigarette smoke. There's nothing pulling us, you know. <laughs> Questions? No. You can't get stuck in hypnosis. Did you know that? <laughs> some, pe some, people, some people have these, and I ask people, are you afraid of anything about hypnosis? Because it's very important. If you're afraid of anything about hypnosis, you won't go into that state. You know, you'll be apprehensive. They say, no, no, I'm not afraid of anything. I always tell people, good. Well, sometimes people are afraid they'll be stuck in it and they won't come out. And this is a very common uh, misconception that people have. It's your own state. You go in and out of it all the time, right? You can't get stuck in it. Uh, it's a very relaxed state of mind. 
as I said, it's similar to daydreaming, where uh, our kind of our conscious mind, our busy mind, recedes. You know, like we're daydreaming, we're like thinking, but we're not actually thinking about something we want to think about. We're just like off wandering. That's our subconscious mind, okay? Our conscious mind recedes. When we go to sleep at night, okay, we go through a state of hypnosis, a hypnagogic state, just before we go to sleep. And what happens is our sub, our conscious mind kind of turns off. And we're not asleep, but we're not awake, and we're just like, <laughs> there. Okay. That's actually hypnosis in there. Our conscious mind, we don't need today. Your conscious mind called me up, got you here, and your conscious mind is the one that made the decision that you don't, you want to be a non-smoker. So we, we have no problem with the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the one who, who did the patches, you know, who did all the trying and everything. So we have no problem with the conscious mind. It's the subconscious mind we're working with. And hypnosis, hypnosis, you're, you're fully awake. It's not sleep. You're fully alert. You're fully conscious. You hear everything that's going on around you. It's just a very relaxed state of mind. And what we're doing is getting you into a position where your wall comes down. Okay? And that you can get across what you want. Okay? And it's, it's completely your choice, which today it is. You know, you, you're here to be non-smokers and get that across to you. Okay? You can't get stuck in it. You know? Uh, one of the things, uh, I, I try to put some of the things on the website so people, people say, well, what if you had a heart attack and died? You know, would I be stuck there? <laughs> what, at, what technically would, what technically would happen? And I tell people, well, I would hope that you would help me because you would know what's going yes. on. <laughs> and, and you could bring yourself out of hypnosis anytime you want. You know, it's, it's, it's just like that. <laughs> I would hope you'd call her. To call the ambulance for me. Yeah. And they, and people will say, well, what if the house catches fire or something? And here the thing is that when you're in hypnosis, your senses are sometimes anywhere from 20 to 200 times more acute. So I tell people, you'll probably know it before me. <laughs> you know. I teach hypnosis also. I teach other hypnotists. So... Uh, it's amazing. We have conventions each year up in Massachusetts. It's amazing some of the things that you can do in hypnosis. Uh, I've seen people with normal vision read phone books across the room while they're in hypnosis. They just hold them up. They usually do that every year. Somebody will do it, a, 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 you know, a, a demonstration of that, you know. I work with a lot of sports players. I got hooked up with a couple guys who played in the major leagues, and they come into town, and I, I work with them. I, they always say, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. Baseball players are weird. They are. <laughs> they, they are the most, uh, people don't realize this, they are the most superstitious people, and they all are. And, and if they're not superstitious, by the time they... They get like to the minor leagues and the major leagues. They all are. They all go through these rituals and everything, and they're and they're just. <laughs> I believe it. They're all head cases. They it. all are, <laughs> you know. And and the ones I've worked with, the, the, you know, they have all the physical ability and everything, and just something good. Their expectation yeah. turns, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, they'll just say, "I can't throw strikes," <laughs> you know. And they'll tell themselves that, and they'll actually hypnotize themselves. I can't throw strikes. I can't throw strikes. I can't throw strikes. You know? And all of a sudden, next thing, they're getting cut. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And all. And I've worked, worked with some hitters, too. I don't know how they hit the ball. I don't. You know, uh, down at the, um, at the, um, um, the Phillies Park, they have a pitching machine that pitches major league speeds up to like 104 to 106 miles an hour. And there's one guy who actually throws 104. 
I, don't, I think I forget who he plays for, but most of them throw in the upper 90s. These mm -hmm. pitchers, and uh, and it's just amazing. You watch these balls going like that. So I haven't played baseball since high school. I said, "Can I get in that cage and see what these balls look like?" And uh, and the guy, goes, yeah, sure. I get in the cage, and I think I tried to swing at one of them. I I, I got about four or five pitches. They're fastballs. You can these computerized machines. You can make it, it put the ball anywhere. You can make it throw all different kinds of pitches, breaking wow. pitches. They're amazing. And so I come out, and I say, how they hit the ball? He goes, and the, uh, the one guy who's, the, uh, well, he's a, he is a batting coach for one team. He said, it's one-tenth of a second. He goes, they have to make all their decisions. He goes, uh, he goes, that's how quick it is. He goes, basically, it's the time that it takes to blink your eyes. Right? Is, is when everything happens. That's crazy. Because I, I couldn't even react. Yeah. They were so fast, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> it's like, whoa! Yeah. And, and I said, I said, you watch these guys on TV. And they just jack the ball out of the park and stuff like it's nothing. He goes, they're used to it. Mm -hmm. He goes, they're used to it. He goes, they've been doing it a long time, you know. Yeah. So, do you uh, have any other questions or anything? I think so. I think yeah. fine. You're good? Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Excited? Very much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Do you have to use the restroom? Um, actually, I will. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah okay. Oh. Is it upstairs yes. when you came in? Yes, right when you came in. Yes. And that's this way. Yep. It's even raining harder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me take a look at your things here. One of the um, things about um, smoking is generally you get a great sense of relief mm -hmm. when you get the habit off your back. It's just like... It's something you've been trying to do for a long time. And one of the feedbacks I get from people, it's just such a relief. Mm -hmm. You know, they just don't have to worry about it anymore. I, know I felt that. I quit, stopped for about 10 months. This was really 10 years ago. And I quit smoking for about 10 months. And I felt that after the first few months, I was like, you know, you're not thinking about having that pack of cigarettes in your pocket, you know. Mm -hmm. you know, when you're going to have your next one, and, you know, it was a real, it was a relief, yeah. Well, one fella, he's a, uh, he came not too long ago, he's a truck driver, okay, and you know what one of the things he resented was, he said, I keep track of like, um, like how many cigarettes I have, and he goes, I would get up in the morning, and, he, and he, he, he must have driven some kind of, like, delivery truck. And he had his roots that he went on. And he said, when I get up in the morning, he goes, one of the first things I do, he goes, is I check how many cigarettes I have. And he goes, I'm already planning where on my route I'm going to stop to get more. And he goes, that's insane. I hate that. You know, that... He goes, that level of control that the cigarettes have in my life. And he goes, then I, as I go through the day, I'll look at the cigarettes and I'll say, do I need to stop before I go home? He goes, cause I, he goes, I have them all planned out. He goes, and he goes, they're just running my life, these little white <laughs> tubes, <laughs> these little tubes, you know, or he goes, and I'll change my schedule to make sure I can stop at the certain store. <laughs> Because I hate that. It's, he said, I feel like a puppet on a string, you know, and all. You do computer validation? Yeah. You validate computer systems? Yeah, like applications. 
For who? Who? who do you I work for Octagon Research. Octagon, okay. Pharmaceutical? Um, yeah. They're actually, they're kind of like a CRO. They're just okay. kind of development. Okay, because I haven't had heard that term for years. Yeah. You know, before I was a full-time hypnotist, I, I used to be in the IT field, yeah, okay. and I used to do consulting. And I used to, uh, a couple times I went, I worked for Merck mm -hmm. and Smith Klein and all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Merck, <clears throat> in their manufacturing, had to do validation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and uh, everybody used to complain about it. Yeah. And I didn't mind it. It was all paperwork. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a lot you of know? documentation. Yeah. yeah, it's all documentation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I used to tell people, hey, it's a job. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They'd say, oh, we have to do all this and do all that. I said, hey, we're making good money doing this. I said, it's not hard work. It just takes time, you know. Okay. Who wants to go first? I said I did. You, you know did? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Are you going to be okay with you? Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to go into my car and smoke a cigarette? No. You can stay here if you want. You can stay, you can both no. stay down here no. if you want or, you know, if you, if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> You're sleepy. He'll probably actually take a nap. Really? <laughs> do you want to go upstairs? Get right into sleep, yeah. Do you want to go upstairs or you can stay here and watch and everything? I'm fine with it. Are you sure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. That's what weird happens. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'd be comfortable with it being. Not with yeah, smoking. Fine, not, not with smoking. <laughs> 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 I've had some other strange things happen, you know, with uh, when people are uh, people come to me for fears mm -hmm. and everything. And sometimes, what what we can do in hypnosis, and we don't do this in smoking because there's no need for it. But when you have a fear, usually it goes back to when you're young. Uh -huh. And the thing is that your subconscious will hide that from you. It was usually a traumatic experience. That's why people are afraid to speak in public and everything. They get right. that anxiety and all. Uh, what we can do, you, your subconscious remembers every, every little thing that ever happened to you. Not only every sight, every sound, every smell, every taste but all the thoughts and emotions coupled with it, okay? Uh, so in hypnosis, we have access to all that. We can go right back. I take people, when they have a fear of public speaking, I take them right back in their mind to first grade, and I have them, they can go down and name everybody in their class, and they're amazed, because that information's all there, wow. you know? I have people come to me, in fact, somebody called me yesterday, lost jewelry, expensive heirloom jewelry, Right. Uh, I usually, usually in about 50% of the cases we can find it. Because, but I tell them, I said, half the time, you're not going to know where it is. Either it's been stolen, right? right? Or it somehow has been moved and you're not aware of it, right? right? But sometimes people do things and they see things that they're not consciously aware of, okay? And, and that can, uh, do it. I, I had one lady who, uh, she kept saying, the last time she saw this stuff was on this uh, sideboard that they had, this big old sideboard. All these um, heirlooms, di it's usually always diamonds. Usually people don't come to see me unless they're worth more than 10 grand, it seems. So here, you know, she goes, I've been through all that sideboard and everything. And I said, that's the uh, last time you were aware where it was. Right. However, she had thought somebody who worked for her uh, around the house had stolen it. We were able to determine that that person had already left and she still had them. So she felt a lot better because she didn't want to get the police involved right, right. because this person was an illegal alien. <laughs> they were going to be deported and had worked for her for like 25 years. So. So she was there. Okay. I said, well, I said that that person was gone. That person left the house and you still had them. So here she called me back like eight months later. She goes, Joe, thank you so much. I said, what? I said, I didn't. I said, we didn't find anything. She goes, we were getting our uh, new flooring. 
she goes, and we, uh, she goes, they had to move that sideboard out. And apparently it was a big, heavy thing, and they moved it out, and here her stuff had fallen down behind it. Wow. And the only thing that they can think was that uh, they started to piece things together. Her husband brought something in uh, that day and put it down on that thing, and he must have shoved those things back, and they went down behind the back of it. You know, so they. She goes. We actually found it, and I said I didn't have anything. Yeah. To I said that, that's the only place you knew where right, it was. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, her husband was also. I said you should have sent your husband over here. I said we could have maybe found. Yeah, yeah, found it. Quicker. Oh. She goes. I didn't know he had anything to do it, and and neither did he. And neither did he. Yeah. yeah, he wasn't yeah. aware that it had happened. You know, now if we'd have put him in hypnosis. His subconscious mind might have seen that, okay? Whereas his conscious mind, it didn't right. register, register, right? That's interesting. So, I said, oh well. Okay, come on over in the hypno chair. Do you want to come up?